the Guadalcanal, Canal, I guess, was considered a part of that. Um, it was uh, one of the longest and bloodiest, uh, I guess, campaigns next to that of uh, the New Britain campaign. Um, again, the reason that uh, the Japanese felt so strongly was they wanted to hold that position. They were really concerned about um, what would happen if America grew strength, was able to outflank them, um, and even take over their own supplies um, and uh, knock out that Pearl Harbor, I guess you could say, a truck, because then most of their naval forces would be gone at that point. Um, so the battle took place over a course of several battles and a course of several days. I think it, um, there was uh, quite a few dogfights that happened, uh, but it was mostly uh, ship maneuvering, dive bombers, that sort of stuff that we'd seen in the war previously up to this point. Uh, statistics, there were uh, 10,600 casual casualties, 40 more ships sunk, and then 80 or so aircraft were shot out of the air um, and left in the Pacific, I guess. So uh, that kind of area, they called it Iron Bottom Bay or something. That uh, uh, yeah. uh, A lot of that not only is not only the ships, but there's a lot of plane wreckage within that. But as you can see, we uh, routed the Japanese in a sense. Uh, 80,000 casualties or more that include ships, planes, and land forces. 50 or more ships were sunk in this whole entirety of the campaign. Um, and over 1,500 aircraft were destroyed. So it's a pretty important uh, victory for the United States and quite a strategic one. A lot of people didn't think that they could win this um, because they didn't know a lot about Pacific fighting. Um, and even uh, they had a strong Navy, but nobody knew how strong their, uh, their Air Force was at that time. So, yeah, I, I'm not gonna make you know all. Yeah, the I was stats. just. Gonna, you don't have to like write. Just, all down. just know that the United States was a really hard fought, mm -hmm. but the U.S. won. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, the Battle of Truk was from February 16th to 17th in 1944. Again, part of Operation Hailstone. Um, it was a major logistics base for the Japanese, um, and it was home to the Imperial Fleet. Again, a lot of battles or uh, battleships, a lot of cruisers. And uh, quite a few aircraft carriers that weren't already deployed or at Tokyo for, was it re... Refitting? Refitting, yeah. So um, I think it had five at the time that were uh, major targets for the United States. And um, they wanted to, uh, I guess, get out of the war. Uh, again, Japanese equivalent to Pearl Harbor um, had a, uh, quite a few air bases, but it, um, the, those air bases that were based on truck were the only ones within, I guess, flyable range to any of the other, I guess, positions and territories that Japan held at that time. So, like all the Solomon Islands, New Guinea, the Philippines and everything, um, that was kind of the central air base uh, for those pilots and for those, um, for the Japanese uh, Air Force. Uh, it was also a major part to the defense of their supply line. Um, so, a big reason America decided to track, uh, attack truck besides to wipe out one of the biggest defensive and military bases, they wanted to show the world that they could be uh, more superior through the air and um, on the water. So it was kind of like a chest pumping action. Uh, not only was it kind of a counterattack after the Doolittle raids, but they really felt like they needed to um, kind of show the world that they were a superpower and that they were ready for this war. So um, all the attacks on truck. Um, they had airstrikes, obviously. There was a lot of surface ship action, which hadn't been seen for a, quite a long time um, at this point, because before it had been done just solely with planes and carriers. So it was the first time that was introduced in the Pacific. Um, there were a lot of nighttime attacks, again, such as with the whole campaign. The Japanese loved to fight at night, but when America's developed, or when Americans developed radar, they completely changed. So they realized they started to get route, routed, and then America kind of tore them apart. Uh, the Japanese also saw this as a surprise attack because they thought America was too weak to attack them. After Pearl Harbor and uh, the rumors about their lacking air and naval strength, they thought that was never going to happen. So here are the stats, I guess. America lost uh, 40 people, 25 aircraft, and uh, damaged damage to one battleship and one carrier, whereas Japanese lost 15 different warships, so that includes cruisers, battleships, and carriers, um, 270 aircraft, and then um, merchant ships. Now, this, I guess, the war in the Pacific also adopted the same attitude, I guess, of, of total war and attrition that 
was developed in the Eastern Hemisphere, or they were even attacking merchant ships and other things like that. They just wanted to clear out the whole harbor of truck and uh, the entire island because they felt like anyone there could be a threat and they kind of wanted to reduce and make the Japanese surrender and they knew the only way they could do that was total surrender because of Bushido, Bushido and the whole code that the Japanese had toward the war. So the Battle of Rabul, it was actually uh, a few separate battles. The first battle was that between um, the Australians and the Japanese and that's how the battle or that's how the island was taken over by Japan. Um, they needed, to, I, they needed, I guess, an island or a place to launch their major offensives and kind of regroup. Um, and so that's why they decided Rabul was the place to do it. Um, and Australia already, Australia being a part of Britain, already had developed some pretty good naval and air bases there. Um, now, uh, the battle at the time lasted two months because there were like sporadic attempts at rescue missions and everything. But the Japanese basically uh, routed the Australian British defense. Um, they outdueled them in the air. Uh, naval uh, defenses weren't very strong. And, uh, the, once the Australian and British soldiers realized that, uh, they knew that they had no choice but to surrender or die. So if you look at the stats for the first battle, um, most of it was air um, and attacking the airfields, burning them down so they couldn't get back up. Um, the Japan suffered very little at all. Um, Australians, there were, I think, 49 casualties, but over a thousand prisoners of war because they realized as soon as they overtook their air and naval defenses, they were pretty much doomed. Um, Rabul did remain with Japan despite Allied efforts, um, but it was kind of like, uh, I guess, not that big of a deal because it was more for a supply line strategy and uh, launching an attack on Australia, which uh, I guess they were a little more concerned with our front than the Australian front in expanding once we joined the war. Um, so this part is kind of when the Allies attacked. Uh, they came in two different ways. There are two different, I guess, bombings or battles. One in 1942 and one in 1943. Um, in 1943, they used a lot more, I guess, airstrikes than they did in 42 and 42. They used more um, ship attacks. And then with each bombing, they actually did two strikes or two waves. So one, and it was mimicked Pearl Harbor quite, um, I guess, quite exactly. They would take dive bombers, and then they'd also take um, air striking planes and go in with the first wave. And then second wave, they'd switch them. So they didn't know which uh, planes were attacking which target. Um, the Japanese defenses and... Um, air bases and everything were almost completely destroyed, so the island was basically useless. But Japan refused to surrender and kept fighting, so they were able to control it. Um, and these are my sources. So, do you guys have any questions or anything like that? There's a couple of things about the dates that are a little bit kind of weird. You have everything in 44, 45, and a lot of Well, like, so Rabul, the... We just go back one, I'll just show you what okay. I mean. Yeah, most of the battles. And they said, you know, and don't worry too much about the dates, just put... But you have 44, 45, but most yeah. of the bombs 42, 43. Yeah, well, that's what, that's because I copied this one up here, like these. And so that would have been in 41. This one? Yeah. Yeah. They said it was like end of 41, start of 42, I think. Yeah, and you have 44, 45. Yeah. So, so that, that's what they just said. The date, that's the beginning of War 41, 42, and then this is. But besides that, uh, yeah, it's kind of like, I feel like it's the kind of same thing repeating again and again. like. They obviously had the same objectives, and every battle was just trying to fulfill that objective or get closer to it. So, and so the big thing we know about the Solomons, truck and rubble, and what happened, and I won't worry too much about the dates on the test. Anything else? No. Yeah, it was really bloody fighting. Have you ever seen a HBO did the show Pacific? Or mm -hmm. yeah, in the first was, of the battles. Of it was actually regarded as one of the most dangerous fronts, I guess, in the time because. I mean, the pilots, horrible conditions, they were running all the time. Like, they just come back, get fuel, get back on the planes, go out. The major dogfights that we saw in the war, the Royal Air Force and the Japanese Force, that was one of the best ones. And then um, over Rabul, and then when America was fighting for Rabul, it was just air fights to the death, basically. So, I don't know. That's, that's about it. And then surreal things at the end. Very good. Yeah. All right, good job. Nice job. You covered a lot. That was good. All right. You probably want my outline. Oh, yeah, I want that.
Oh, and I do need your outline or whatever, Dylan. We just when you get a chance, give it to me. Not a big deal. Yeah. Did you film this? I did. There you go. Oh, whoa. That's not my name. Got it. Mm -hmm. well, I, I don't know why it's doing that. Why do I get out of it? Go back. Go back. Go back. Go back. I'm gonna. No, hit that. See that. The little gap. Sit down. Yeah, I'm annoyed. Mine's like really short. Finding information is really hard. The only thing I would say, um, to both the back. Can you get this on the thing? Oh my god, I did it! Yeah. That's the only thing. Yeah, hit the little, scroll down, just bring it down. I hit the number. It is big. I already got a full screen. Uh huh? I got it. Why is it messing me up? Because I want to. Yeah, the only thing map has been out is really good. Yeah, and I like the map. I'm not seeing that map. The other one you showed, that was a good one. Okay, so I did uh, in black, which is the Australian New Zealand and New Zealand Army Corporation. And so obviously the two countries involved are Australia and New Zealand. Uh, Australia was a British territory, therefore they went to war because Britain did. Um, this is just a few little facts about like the background on the army. Uh, Australia and New Zealand were both relatively new and growing countries, so they didn't have very many people. Um, and then we've got Australia had 3,000 permanent men and 80,000 militiamen in their army, uh, so it wasn't very big at all. Uh, you need um, long numbers for that. Yeah. Uh, Australia adopted conscription a few years after the war started for their army, but not for the Air Force or anything like that. And the Prime Minister of New Zealand, uh, Fraser, was actually in prison because he campaigned against conscription. I also thought this, uh, their coat of arms was really funny. And I brought that up with the Australian I know, and they got so defensive about it, and it was really funny. Um, so the weapons we have that were commonly used, we have the Owen gun, so there are a lot of you know, automatic and semi-automatic uh, rifles. This is an armored car called a dingo. This is an actual dingo, not actually used in the war. Why not? <laughs> you know, I don't know. I think they were probably hard to paint. Uh, this is a staghound. They have a lot of tanks for such a small army. This is a sentinel. Uh, the three biggest names of the war were uh, Flammy, and he's from Wagga Wagga, uh, which I'll be visiting soon. Um, and then he's the one who signed the Japanese surrender document for Australia. So he was like the, the big guy. Uh, Raul is from Lockley's, and he was just the chief of staff, so he was kind of like second in command. And Freiburg was a New Zealand general, but he was from England. Blaney, I would just ask, you know, he was probably the most prominent Australian one, and that big good one to ask if he signed the documents. I don't know if I'd ask well. You was. made me put Freiburg on Because it's good for the presentation. Them. Okay, I'll ask about Freiburg. And I will ask about Dingo. Thanks. So, Thanks. Dingo ate yeah. your baby. Okay. What's that? For the movie. So. The biggest battle that uh, Australia was involved in is Port Moresby. Uh, it's the capital of New Guinea. Sorry, it's the capital of New Guinea. Um, it was a part of the Battle of the Coral Sea. And what the Australians did is they used mainly aircraft carriers and a few land-based planes to divert Japan away from the Battle of the Coral Sea uh, to kind of you know help the Allies out. And they succeeded, and it removed the immediate. Threat. Uh, it kind of only just delayed it basically, but it gave the allies time to prepare. It was from May 4th through May 8th, so it lasted about four days. And a lot of people would say that it saved Australia from invasion. So the only reason Australia wasn't like fully involved in the war the whole way through is because they delayed or diverted the Japanese at Fort Moresby. Um, just a fun little fact, Mr. Partridge, let me throw in. 
Uh, the Anzac employed Australian citizens who lived along the shoreline to watch for Japanese invaders. So you just had these guys like sitting out on their boats and their lighthouses and stuff, just like looking, just all the time, and they got paid to do that. That's such really cool. And then uh, we have 575,799 Anzac soldiers who served overseas. About 39,000 of them died, 66,000 were wounded, and 20 men were awarded the Victoria Cross, which is a huge deal for Britain. Um, it's considered the war that saved Australia, and they still celebrate what's called Anzac Day, which is actually really frustrating because all I could find when I was searching Anzac was Anzac Day. And it's just a really big holiday, kind of like how we celebrate Memorial Day and stuff. Uh, Anzac was kind of like, it kind of dissipated after World War II. They only ever really served in World War I and World War II, and now they just have like their normal military, I guess. Um, but it was a huge deal, and I believe the last surviving Anzac died recently. Um, and yeah. I forgot to put that in there. It's fake. Yeah, it is fake. Okay, any questions? It's just a great question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, so no questions? Good. Cool. It's so crazy. All right, good job. All right, I've got yeah, a little bit about Australia. They ended the war fighting Borneo. Australia's own New Zealanders would fight. I'm like, you want to start that one? Oh no, what's the bell ring? We got time. Mine isn't very long. Are you Google? Are you Google? Typing up there. No, I mean, I got the keyboard here. I do have an electronic keyboard, but I I know I have a very good yeah, really know. Grab your note, like, give me. Said, I'll just keep going. Alex, you have your outlines. I don't have any comments. But I can bring it. We're in the middle of moving, so a lot of stuff got packed up, and it's just. Yeah, yeah. I also don't have any of my textbooks. Mm -hmm. And then you also need to buy fire. Yeah, and it's all the way to the house. actually, we saved a blind one, like a double. Get to me, get to me tomorrow, okay? Alright. Yeah. Or it's every time. Oh! Alright, so I did the battles of Philip So it took place from June 19th to 20th in 1944, and it was an overwhelming American victory. It was a naval and aerial battle that was mostly with carriers, and it severely damaged the Japanese Navy, and after this, it, they could not really fully recover because of their losses that they suffered. So it happened because the ja Japan wanted the Marianas Islands for defense as part of their whole little Pacific thing, and uh, there were U.S. ships that were en route to Saipan as backup, and Japan decided to challenge these ships with 430 planes. So out of the 430 planes that Japan sent, over 300 were shot down, so it was mostly unsuccessful. And that was called the Marianas Turkey Shoot because they were basically just shooting planes out of the sky most of the day. Uh, Japan lost two aircraft carriers that day uh, because of U.S. submarines shooting torpedoes. And the U.S. lost 23 planes, and that is the U.S.'s Bunker Hill. It was nearly hit by a Japanese bomb, but it survived. So the Japanese Admiral Ozawa thought that all of the 300 missing planes had actually landed on Guam. He did not know that they were all destroyed, so he thought that if he just maintained his position, he would be safe. But that was a bad decision because he did not actually have very many planes. And the U.S. launched a second attack. And in this attack, they shot down 65 Japanese planes and sunk another one of Japan's carriers. And Japan shot down 100 U.S. planes. So overall losses, the U.S. lost 100. What? No, that's just. Oh, we, you don't even know every detail.
Are we okay? Oh, we had a pen break. <laughs> All we know just it was a big you uh, the Mariana circuit shoot and a big US victory. Yeah, so the US lost 123 aircraft and one of their battleships was damaged. And then Japan lost 480 aircraft and three carriers, which is a major loss. And the, the U.S. Admiral Spruant, he was criticized because a lot of the other admirals said that he was too cautious and that he could have used the superior force he had to completely wipe out the Japanese Navy that was there. But instead, he, he didn't and just did what he needed to to get to Saipan. And he did this because he knew that his orders were just to act as backup for the fleet that was already at Saipan and not to attack Japan. So that's why he did not use all of the force he could have. These are some pictures. Just a lot of plain marks in the sky contrails. And then, oh, I stuck a picture in the toys. No. Whatever. This is a plane landing on the Lexington. That's the second Lexington. Remember the first one was sunk. Do you know about the night landings? Night landings? No. I didn't say anything about that. When, after the battle, and they sent all their planes up, the Americans, they attacked really late in the afternoon. And it was just at the edge, literally the edge of their range. And so when they were flying back to the American fleet, it got dark. And it was a real big decision where you turn on the lights on the carriers. Because if you turn on the lights on the carriers, what happens? Especially enemy subs. And they knew enemy subs were around. And so Spruance waited, 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 and then finally turned the lights on. But still, 50 planes had to ditch. I mean, land and see him all for the best. Okay. Yeah. Big battle. Did they get rescued? Those people that went by after. You know, he's big. Yeah, I know that sounds stupid, but it really is. All right, good job. And Bill can see the interesting battle. I mean, the, the, the Mariana's turkey shoot. And so, we went a little out of whack because I blame all on Sarah and Jamie. But then Jamie's would have fit right before, right before we had the Battle of Coral Sea. Yours would have fit right before Coral Sea and, and Midway. I mean, right before Coral Sea, I mean, right before we got to Ramol and Trock. And then we have to do, so after the Marianas, and this is the last thing we have to get now. This is just for your regular notes, for your regular notes. Then the big decision was, where next? The United States, Australians, the Australians that kind of didn't want to fight anymore. They had all kinds of political issues. But where next? Do they, actually the Australians have been more in Borneo. But MacArthur, General MacArthur definitely wanted to go to the Philippines and retake the Philippines where he was forced to retreat and pretty much run away in the middle of the night before the Japanese took it in April of 1944. So the Philippines. Admiral Nimitz wanted to go to Formosa. What country is Formosa today? Taiwan. Yeah, that's Taiwan. They met. They met at in Pearl Harbor. FDR flew there, and in a very actually MacArthur did this just amazing presentation and swayed FDR, and they decided we will attack the Philippine Islands. So we'll go to the Philippines and then get closer to the Japan. In reality, they should have done neither. <laughs> they should have just kept, they should have left them all and isolated them, like they did with Bowl and Truck, just left them withering on the vine, essentially. Just so you get an idea, Truck is right here. Rebol's here. Those are the Solomons. Mariana's here. The Afghanistan's here. Madagascar would be right about here. Afghanistan. There's no Pakistan yet. Still part of British India. And one more thing then. That sets up the invasion of the Philippines. And the, the Japanese have a counter strike against it. And that will be Sam tomorrow. And the Battle of Manila, which will be Elon. Sound good? How uh, in depth do you want to go? How in depth? Just Personal story, personal story. Yeah, I want. I want to basically. I want to know the names of every soldier that's fought there. 
Yeah. Just give a little bit of background. Be really like, like, what do you have? Like, like, and then all the battle. Going through the battle of the street fighting and a little bit of how awful the fighting was with the Yes, yeah, you, you mentioned the POW, right? Mentioned the POW once, and then maybe just it's limited like one slide. Basically, like, story about the same thing. Does that makes sense. You don't want to talk about late the first place he made. It gets sanded and covers the ground. That's the four years. No, yours will not be first. Yours will be after that. Because they did that after here. Then we go to Yujima. Then we go to Okinawa, which we're going to watch something in Okinawa because that's what I'm going to be gone on Friday. It's okay. It's okay. I'll be back. I can't wait to see you. And then we we'll come back, we'll do the weapons, and then finish up with that. Sound good? Wait, so when does my situation next Monday? When, when do you have this? Are you doing yes. this? Yeah, I just want to make parts. Oh, one more thing. So now that I got everyone's attention, please start thinking about this now. Bands. I'll start. Talking about it now, I've already taken a few people. Um, I've already made a rule no Australian bands. But then after that, did you want to do ACDC? Only three other people did. Okay, we will flip coins. We'll do Bolt the Ring and Rock, Paper, Scissors at the same time for ACDC. No, they have to have been popular before 1995. Huh? No Collins hurts my ears. And so, Nobody, nobody with a living soul likes Bill Collins. So, no, Bill Collins and you can also add in Genesis. That's, enough. That's a good one. If you play Bill Collins' song, uh, we would have to reboot you. And one more thing you have to show how Bill Collins looks like Charlie Brown. Yeah, it's, it's terrifying. You can't tell me that's not the same person. <laughs> <laughs> no, it has to be popular for 1995. Now, there's a few things like if somebody like doing genre, that be, and they have to have enough information on. So, ACDC, you have enough Alex. What did you What did you want to do? Okay, I don't know who that is. Yeah, but <laughs> prove I'm doing that. But I know you're lying because you said something. And with just enough information, but there are some genres of music, like bubble gum music of the late 60s. And that's just kind of funny like, list, you know, that's a good one with us great. Yummy, yummy, yummy. And, like and I feel like loving you. Oh yeah, that's a song. <laughs> Nirvana. Nirvana, I mean, it's just around the end of the Green Day. Green Day, their big album was 93. Yeah, it was after the Nirvana. I thought it was before. Yeah, it was before. Yeah, What's in it? I have no idea. Oh, so you're just making stuff. Yeah, I'm just talking. David Bowie's fine. I know. It's something If it's music, we can talk about that. We're just thinking about it. Okay. I have a presentation. I found a couple of websites that one second. Yeah. I don't know what I caught it. I don't know what I caught it. What they did is, the one that said nine months, what they did is that they had, it was a continuous model. Okay. But they started, and then, and then that, then that just continued. So, okay. but the other one, they started as early as almost a year before. Okay. So that's, okay. so you're, yeah. And I understand, yeah, that doesn't make, yeah. I guess so. Oh, thank you. Oh, God, that's a crew. Yeah, it is. So you're two. What? Zero? You gave each zero? Oh, thank you for this. Oh. Okay. 